Welcome uh, to Building Lightweight Microservices with Redis. Uh, thanks for attending this talk, and um, thanks to Redis Labs for having me. I know it's late in the day, and I promise you a lively presentation. Let's get started. A bit about me. My name is Carlos Justiniano. I hold a 2005 Guinness World Record in distributed computation. Blah, 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 blah. I won't bore you with the details. You can find out more about that on Google. I'm also chief architect at uh, Flywheel Sports. Um, I've been a Redis user since about 2011. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and GitHub at CJUST and on um, CJUST.me. Before we dive in, I'd like to quickly clarify what I mean by lightweight microservices. Light on external complexity and dependencies, meaning microservices which limit the number of external software and infrastructure dependencies. Not light as in limited, so microservices which are not limited in what they can do. Two disclaimers are in order. The first is that the approach I'll share with you in this presentation may not be a good fit for your projects. You may need heavier microservices, and that's okay. The second disclaimer is that the first half of this presentation may seem a little bit fluffy, but trust me, you're in the right place, and I promise you, we'll get increasingly technical. Don't say I didn't warn you. So as I said, I'm with Flywheel Sports. Flywheel was founded in 2010 in New York City as an indoor stadium cycling studio. Our fitness programs feature high energy workouts that will challenge even seasoned athletes. A cool thing that we do is add sensors and microcontrollers to our bikes in order to track performance metrics. So we've been doing IoT for the past eight years. We have roughly 1,200 employees across 42 studios in the United States. Three of those studios are right here in the Bay Area, one on Market Street here in San Francisco, one in Sunnyvale, and another in Walnut Creek. You can try a free class on us using the offer code FlyRedis. Much of what I'll share with you today has been proven at Flywheel Sports and a group of other companies. So I'll use Flywheel as a case study during this presentation. Last summer, we prepared to launch our Fly Anywhere platform, which allows our customers to ride at home using our nationwide live video streaming service. How cool is that? Now, while we're not the first movers in this space, we are aggressively innovating. Here's a quick, short, pre-launch clip that we posted on social media. A few months later, we launched our Fly Anywhere platform. Now, you can ride Flywheel anywhere. Our first ever at home bike is built for athletes with a fluid, flexible frame. Ride with a monitor, use your personal device, or seamlessly connect to any TV in your home for an experience that feels like you're in our studio. Stream our classes live or on demand, taught by dozens of badass instructors. Meet your goals by riding with a pack, or up your game with a pacer. Either way, our Fly Intelligence Engine learns how you ride to deliver you classes based on your goals, while our torque board and power score will definitely hold you accountable, so you always know where you stand among our community of over a half million never coasters. Fly anywhere, because limits were made to be broken. We're proud of our bike tech and nationwide launch of Fly Anywhere. And we're pleased that we did this while embracing microservices and Redis. Although, things didn't start out that way. Just over two years ago, we started thinking about embracing microservices. The catalyst for this was our CTO, Mike Rolando, who was recruited from Nike, where they built microservices. Before joining Flywheel, I learned about their existing monolith. Now, a problem with all monoliths is that they have a tendency to continue to grow over time. And that's exactly what happened at Flywheel during a five-year period. Working with a monolith can be 
you know, challenging as code becomes highly interdependent. Over time, this can lead to bugs. And in some cases, if you're not careful, a combination of bugs and interrelated code can lead to catastrophic failure as the entire monolith goes up in flames. True story. But it's also a worst case. It's worth noting that the construction of monoliths are often unintentional. No one says, hey, let's see how big we can make this thing. The truth is, the increase in size is often the result of convenience. An alternative approach is to build modular and distributed systems. The microservice architecture is one such approach, which embraces both focused modularity and distributed computing. The end result is a collection of loosely coupled systems. The resulting modularity is great. However, the distributed nature introduces its own set of challenges, namely that communication is also distributed, and so network failures and system availability become important concerns. Still, we were clear we wanted to choose microservices over monoliths. After all, how hard could it be? I'll let you soak in this slide. You know, pat yourself on the back if you're familiar with each of these terms. If you're like the rest of us, some of those terms are still on your checklist. Now, you don't need to know all of this in order to build microservices, but they are important tools and concepts. So, there was a lot to consider, and unfortunately, we were a small team with limited resources. That's three strikes if you're counting. Experts will tell you that small teams should not embrace microservices. One reason is that the microservices approach adds to the already busy workload that developers have. There are you know, lots to consider while embracing microservices, such as you know, how services will work together, be monitored and, and debugged, and how their data sources will be organized. So, a core challenge is that there's much to learn, which amounts to a lot of study time for an already busy team. So those were certainly concerns for us. We were also well aware of the great solutions that larger companies developed and open sourced. However, even those gifts from the gods come with steep learning curves. So a reality check was in order. We're not Netflix. And chances are you're not either. Naturally, if you are Netflix, then you have Netflix-sized problems, which require extensive engineering by large teams. Given our size, development budget, and real business priorities, we needed to right-size a solution. We needed something small and robust to quickly get us started, while affording us a runway so that we could later embrace other solutions as needed. In his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, self-help author Stephen Covey wrote in habit number two, begin with the end in mind. That is, begin by understanding the outcome you're after, then, look to, then work towards that outcome. So we started by assembling a checklist of features we felt we needed. If you already work with microservices, then this checklist is probably quite familiar. One of our most important goals was that an ideal solution had to be simple to use by less experienced developers, ideally implemented as a single package import. So I've been working with Redis for some time. Along the way, as I considered our checklist, I decided to take a closer look at Redis. I started seeing Redis as a sort of distributed computing glue. It looked like Redis could be used to bind and unify microservices. Each microservice binds to a shared Redis cluster. Presence is maintained with key and expiration. Interprocess communication via PubSub. Routes placed in set stores. But was it possible? Microservice features using a single infrastructure dependency? We thought so. So we built an internal library called Hydra. The name Hydra seemed ideal because a service type often has multiple instances working together as a larger beast. 
On the right side is a list of features we were able to support. By the way, you'll be hearing the name Hydra a lot in this presentation because I'll use Hydra as a practical example of how Redis can be leveraged to build microservices. Let's take a closer look. Here we see three microservices, each with a Hydra module which connects to Redis. In this model, most services don't commu communicate with Redis directly. Rather, the underlying Hydra module proxies to Redis. Another point about this diagram is that Hydra is just another imported module, just like the one shown in green. Hydra is only shown in blue at the bottom to illustrate its presence and connection to Redis. Here's a scaled down view of Hydra as a JavaScript class. There are actually 20, excuse me, 36 member functions in total. But this snapshot provides a sense of the ease of our abstractions. So Hydra, with a single module import, and fairly simple class methods allowed us to chisel away at our monolith and start building our Fly Anywhere platform as a collection of services powered by Redis. Fast forward nine months. Fly Anywhere was already well underway, and Hydra was working really well for us. And we felt it would be useful to others. So on November 7, 2016, at the Smithsonian Museum of the American Indian in downtown Manhattan, we open sourced Hydra on stage at the Empire Node Conference. I demoed Hydra running on a cluster of Raspberry Pis. My point in building the cluster was to reinforce the notion of a lightweight microservice library. In fact, light enough to run on $5 Raspberry Pi Zeros. Here's a close-up view of the cluster. It consists of eight computers, seven of which are Raspberry Pis, and one of which is an Arduino-based microcontroller. Each of the Pis are running Hydra-enabled microservices using Node 6.5. In total, the cluster contains 16 CPU cores. In order to further add context to this presentation, I'll briefly show you Hydra in action. Then we'll look under the hood to see how Hydra leverages Redis to form a lightweight microservices library. We'll drop down to the command line and launch a Docker Swarm cluster consisting of a dozen or so microservices. Some of the core services include Neo4j, MongoDB, and Redis, and the rest are Hydra-enabled microservices. We'll give that a bit. One of the services uh, we'll be interested in is, and, uh, and see in action is the Hydra router, which is a dynamic service aware router. Next, we'll launch this dashboard via the provided URL. Here we see the Hydra Router dashboard. If we scroll the page, we can see all of the services we launched. So we see an image processing service, a notification service, an order service. These are not services used by Flywheel. These are services used by a buddy of mine who's doing work for one of the largest printing companies on the East Coast. So I use the services for this demo. So if you look closely, you can see that the um, Hydra Router um, instance ID um, and a port are the same as uh, shown at the top there. If you look above the, the input line, you'll see that it's Hydra Router 1.6.9 experimental. But you see that the, um, the ID and the, um, the instance ID match what's shown there. We can ask the Hydra Router. Uh, for its version by typing v1 router version. So Hydra router accepts some um, uh, you know, RESTful calls. Yep, that's the version. We can see its health information via v1 router health. So some pretty useful information. We'll get back to this.
And we can also see a list of nodes that are running. So you saw the graphical view of these nodes. This is the actual JSON data um, set that comes back from, from them. We can even see the API routes for all the registered services. So that's another thing. Services are registering routes. You can actually peruse them. One of the cool things we can do is to speak to other services in the cluster through Hydro Router. Here I'll ask the asset service to return its health information. We can do the same uh, for the auth service. So we're seeing that Hydro Router itself, a Hydro service, is able to monitor the presence of services running in the cluster. Let's kick this up a notch. On the center, on the top center, we see that we have only one instance of the off service running. Let's launch more instances. First, let's check to see how many instances are running. We see that there's one of one uh, running, shown there on the right. Next, we'll use the Docker service scale command to launch two more instances for a total of three. Switching back to the dashboard, we see that we now have three instances of the off service running. Zooming in, we can see that each instance has a unique instance ID. Now we can call the health endpoint on the off service. If we refresh the page, we'll see that we get back uh, different results for each of the different instances. Our requests through Hydro Router are being load balanced across available auth instances. Now let's drop two of our auth instances to see what happens. So we're going to scale it back to one off instance. And we'll just use a Docker scale command here as well, just setting it to one. OK. Give it a second. We see that two of our instances are now in red, indicating that they've lost presence. And we're left with only one instance with an ID starting with 82 and ending in 35. Let's take a closer look. Let's try our health check uh, calls again. So as we refresh the browser, we see that we get back a response from instance ending in 82, uh, excuse me, starting with 82 and ending with 35. Refreshing the browser um, shows us that that's the only instance uh, that's responding, because the other two are unavailable. Let's tell Hydro Router uh, to clear uh, the dead instances that are shown in red. We can do that using the v1 router clear endpoint. So that was presence and load balancing in action. Now let's try messaging. For this demo, we'll use the HMR service, which simply uh, relays messages that it receives back to the sender. It's a good testing um, app for messaging. Give that a second. So we'll open a uh, WebSocket um, client that's just a, pl uh, a Chrome plugin um, and connect to Hydra. 
So we do that by just typing WS using the WebSocket protocol. In this case, I say localhost, but actually it's going to um, the Docker cluster. So what comes back is uh, connection messages, a message from Hydro Router. So we see it's type connection. We also see that it was sent to the client there on line two, and it, it's given the client an ID. Also, it's telling us that it's from the Hydro Router at 08, ending in BA, I believe. So now we'll send a message to the HMR service. We structure the message with the two. We tell it, hey, it's coming from the client. Um, the MID is something we can look at later. Uh, there's a timestamp, optional. And we're basically sending a test message that says hello. And we'll just click on the send button. And if we scroll back to the bottom, you will see that we did receive a response uh, through Hydro Router, but it came from the HMR service. And it gives us the instance ID of that service. We also see sort of a text description of what just happened, um, showing the instance ID um, that came back. The last demo I'd like to share with you is the use of TCP dump to see the underlying Redis packets moving between microservices. I'll issue a dump command. Password required. There we go. Here are the packets moving between microservices and Redis. So if we stop the trace, uh, we see the actual details. We can see various bits of TCP data, such as the sequence and length of the packet. And we can see Redis commands such as setx and hset. A key takeaway in these demos is that you know, what you've seen is powered by Redis at a much lower level. The last thing we'll do is tear down the cluster um, and continue the presentation. As you can see, Hydra is doing quite a bit with the help of Redis. Let's deep dive into how Redis can be leveraged to enable each of these features. Keep in mind that you don't need Hydra. Each of these features is made possible using Redis, and you can certainly do this in your own apps. What Hydra does do is automate and abstract the underlying details. That's something you should strive for if you build or use a similar library. Another key point in what I'll show you is that some of these features are only made possible when combined. For example, request and message routing depend on presence, health, service discovery, and load balancing. As you know, each of these features can be addressed using various infrastructure tools. However, one key advantage of, in what I'll show you is that these features can also be um, implemented just using Redis and your favorite programming language. As we take a closer look, keep in mind that there is a meta context that binds higher level abstractions. And there is a wonderful word which describes the end results. Synergy, when, when the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. We believe that this is especially true with Redis. Early on, it became clear that some thought needed to go into how to organize the Redis key space. Hydra uses keys, which consist of names uh, with two to four segment labels, separated by a colon character. The segment labels are name, prefix, service name, instance ID, and type. The prefix segment allows for filtering Hydra versus non-Hydra keys. If you make heavy use of Redis, then being able to filter for specific keys is vital. The service name segment aids in filtering keys for a particular service type. Examples would be authorization, user, or an image processing service. The instance ID segment allows filtering keys for a unique service instance. When running microservices, you typically want multiple instances of a service type running. Each service instance is assigned a unique ID, and being able to differentiate between them is useful. Lastly, there's a type segment, which is used to classify the purpose of a key. Not all of the segments are present in each key. For example, service name and instance ID are not required in some keys. Here's an example of the key for the user service. We see the prefix, which is Hydra service, followed by the service name. 
in this case, user service. Next, we see the unique instance ID. And lastly, we see that the type of this key is presence. So we say that presence information is stored at this key address. We can enter the Redis CLI and type Redis commands to view various keys. We'll see examples of this throughout the remainder of this presentation. To recap, our use of keys in Redis is organized by segments, which makes them easier to query. Furthermore, a consistent organization makes them easier to extend and maintain. As we continue, we'll see the role that keys play in the organization of each microservice feature. Let's begin by examining presence. In the world of microservices, the ability to discover services and to know whether a service is healthy and can be routed to is of paramount importance. Those features depend on knowing that a particular service instance is actually present and available for use. This is also required for features like service discovery, routing, and load balancing. Once a second, Hydra updates the TTL, or time to live, of its service key. Failure to do so within a three-second period will result in the key expiring and the host app being perceived as unavailable. We can see here that the Redis commands are just get and set x, which set the key in expiration. We can query presence keys using the keys command with a pattern match. Note that there are three keys present. This tells us that there are three instances of the off service running, or asset service in this case. If we attempt to retrieve the contents of one of those keys, we see that it contains just the instance ID. Using the TTL key, uh, command against the key shows us that this particular key has two remaining seconds before it, it expires. So to recap, presence can be managed using keys which auto expire. Updating the key is done automatically by Hydra on behalf of the host service, meaning it's not something the developer does. Failure to update the key within three seconds results in the service being perceived as unavailable. That probably means the service isn't healthy. Which brings us to our next topic. Being able to monitor the health of a microservice is another important feature. Hydra gathers and writes health information snapshots every five seconds. You can, you can quickly check a snapshot uh, to view an individual service's health uh, details. And the snapshots can be used by monitoring tools such as the Hydro Router dashboard we saw earlier. So here's what the health key looks like. Notice that the only new bit is the type segment identifying the key as being about health. When we view the contents of the key, we see that it contains stringified uh, JSON uh, text. In this case, it's for the uh, project service. Unstringifying the JSON makes it easier to see what's stored. It contains lots of useful information. <clears throat> so health information can be stored per service instance. It's managed using a service key, or a string key rather, that contains stringified JSON text. And that information can be used by monitoring apps. Next, let's consider service discovery, which is another must-have feature for any microservice architecture. The ability to discover the IP address and port of a service by name <clears throat> greatly simplifies communication. Other bonus points include not having to manage DNS entries or create fixed routing rules. Service discovery information is stored in a Redis hash with a type of nodes. The use of the hash enables blazing fast lookups. We use the Redis hget, hset, hget all commands to work with the nodes hash. The following Redis operations can be used to implement service discovery. The first is the lookup for a particular service type. The second is a lookup for available instances. And the third lookup allows Hydra to retrieve information about a specific service instance. We can see useful information such as the version of the service, the instance ID, IP address, port, and finally the host name. In this example, the host name also happens to be the, the Docker container ID. We can retrieve information about all available instances using the Redis hgetall command. This is how Hydro Router retrieves a list of services to show on its dashboard. So no magic. So let's recap. Hydro queries using the service name key segment in order to discover various bits about a service. 
Service details can be managed using a Redis hash, which offers blazing fast lookups. Next, let's consider routes or routing. Routing both HTTP messages and WebSocket or PubSub require that routes be validated. Microservices can publish their routes to Redis. We saw that earlier. As an example, Hydra uses the publish routes to implement dynamic service-aware uh, routing. Each service publishes its key or uh, routes to a key of type service routes. We see here that the key shown is for the asset um, services routes. Service routes can be stored in a set structure, a good choice, because you don't want duplicate route entries. The sAdd and sMember commands are used. Now, as an aside, Redis's rich collection of data structures is one of the reasons that what I'm sharing with you is even possible. Returning back to routes, we can pull a list of routes using a key pattern. Here we see the routes for a number of services. We can use the yesmembers command to view the contents of a specific route set. By the way, the get, post, and put bits represent HTTP REST endpoints. For other messaging transports, the use of bracket methods um, can be omitted. So let's recap. Each service publishes its routes to a Redis set. Accessing an individual route reveals a collection of route entries for that service. Routes are stored in Redis using a set data structure, which avoids duplicate routes. The published routes can be used to implement service-aware um, or dynamic routing. Next, let's consider load balancing. As your application grows, you'll need to load balance requests among available service instances. This is accomplished with Redis using the service presence and routing features we've seen. At an application level, using Hydra, this is as simple as uh, using the make API request if it's RESTful, or the send message um, call if it's uh, you know, pub sub or just JSON message. Load balancing takes place inside those calls as Hydra uses routes and presence information to choose among available target instances. A nice benefit is that during routing, if a request fails to a particular instance, Hydra is able to retry other available instances before returning an HTTP 503 server unavailable error. As you can see here, load balancing relies on other features such as presence, service discovery, and routes. When presence is queried, individual service details can be retrieved. Here we see that for the asset service, we can obtain its IP address and port. To recap, load balancing requests among services can be accomplished using presence, service discovery, and routing features we've already seen. Redis strings, hashes, sets make this possible. Again, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Distributed services are forced to communicate with one another over an underlying network because they're distributed. Um, HTTP REST calls are probably most common, but socket messaging can be far more efficient. Messaging in Hydra is accomplished using Redis PubSub channels, and Redis implements PubSub over socket connections. Here's an example uh, key. Hydra uses the subscribe, unsubscribe, and publish commands along the way. As an aside, the Hydra router is able to accept messages over HTTP and WebSockets and convert them to PubSub messages. We saw that earlier. To understand how this works, consider two services, the asset service and the project service. Each service creates two keys, one using its service name and another using its service name and instance ID. Each service listens to both channels. In most cases, you don't care which instance of a service handles your request. In those cases, the channel without a specific instance ID is used. Now, when you need to send a message to a specific instance, the channel with the instance ID can be used. It's important to note that Hydra converts requests to a service name to one with a specific instance ID when it load balances. That ensures that only one instance handles a given message or request. We can see a list of um, channel keys using the Redis pub sub channels command. Notice that we have four keys here. The first is the name of the asset service, shared by all instances of the asset service. Next, we see three additional keys with unique instance IDs, one for each of the three service instances. 
Continuing with our focus on messaging, in order to ensure interoperability between microservices, it's essential to standardize on a shared format of communication. The universal message format is a documented JSON-based format which includes support for messaging, routing, and queuing. These messages are stored in Redis as stringified JSON text. Here's an example of a UMF message. The two from embody fields are required, and services are free to um, customize um, in the body portion of the object. And we saw this earlier um, when we sent messages, WebSocket messages. Let's see how this is used in practice. On the left, the client service sends a message to the project service. Note that this only requires a UMF creation call and a send message call shown here in yellow. On the right side, the project service listens for messages and processes them as necessary. That's accomplished using event, an event message listener. Note that Hydra abstracts away the service discovery, load balancing, routing, and pub sub specifics. Sending and receiving messages only involves stream member functions. So it's worth pausing here for a brief moment. Take a few seconds to consider what this example would look like using your favorite stack. Let's take a closer look. Send message works by parsing the to field to determine uh, where the, the destination of the, of the service. With the service name in hand, the next step is to check for available instances. With the target instance in hand, the message is then stringified and sent via the Redis publish command. Again, we can list all the pub sub channels in Redis. Messages can be sent via these channels and retrieved by listeners. So, with a bit of programming code, we're able to use Redis to route messages using a well-defined collection of channels. In summary, it's worth noting that messaging is eventually necessary because services are physically distributed. Redis enables messaging using its pub sub features. Standardizing communication enables interoperability between services. We also saw how easy communication can be at an application level when we abstract away the underlying service discovery, load balancing, routing, and pub sub specifics. Next, uh, job and message queues are yet another important uh, part of any non-trivial application. Hydra uses Redis to maintain dynamic uh, queues for each service type. Service instances can then, be, can then read their queues and process them. The content of a queued message is a UMF message, which allows for the same format used for messaging. Again, interoperability is king. Hydra automatically creates th three queues per service type, a received queue, an in-process queue, and an incomplete queue. Because these um, are list using Redis, uh, we can use the LPush, RPush, RPOP, LPush, and um, LRAM commands. Here's a diagram showing the message flow between queues. The movement of items between queues is an atomic operation in Redis, so it's safe regardless of how many microservices you have. On the left, queuing a message is as simple as creating a UMF message and calling queue message to send it. The code on the lower right shows the message processing, the image is rather the image processing service dequeuing the message just by calling get queue message and later marking it with mark queue message once it's uh, completed with the message. I mean, how easy is that? So to recap, sometimes it isn't feasible to expect an immediate response. In those cases, we need to queue work for later processing. The Redis list data structure can be used as a message queue. Commands like lpush and r pop lpush with atomic operations make this feasible. Here again, we saw how easy basic queuing can be using higher level abstractions. Distributed logging is another vital feature of any microservices architecture. However, if you know Redis, you might be appalled at the thought of using it as a distributed logger, and you'd probably uh, be rightfully concerned. However, you could use it as a flight recorder, where you only store the most serious errors and you limit the number of entries using LPush and LTrim. Then at least you'd have a quick way of checking what might have gone wrong with your microservice. Here's what the key looks like. Notice that the, the key is of type health log. Here we see the health log key is actually a list data structure. 
So we can use the Redis L range command to view the flight recorder log for the image processing service. Recapping, having dozens of, having logs across dozens or worse, hundreds of machines isn't feasible with microservices. Distributed logging is definitely the way to go. Uh, using Redis, you can at least build a lightweight logger to use as a flight recorder. Using Redis uh, list data structure and the handy L push and L trim commands make this possible. Now lastly, let's consider configuration management. Managing the configuration files for distributed uh, microservices can be challenging. However, you can even use Redis to store config files for your services. We did this, and it seemed like a good idea at the time. However, <laughs> we're starting to move away from it, as the core disadvantage is that storing configs in Redis makes Redis stateful, and that's less than ideal. But it is possible, so I'd like to share this with you. Let's see how this works. So there's a keys um, type, which is a hash. The hash has a key consisting of a service version and the value set to um, the configuration data for that version. Pretty straightforward. There's a sample config. In our case, we use a command line tool called Hydro CLI, which allowed us to push config files uh, for a specific service version. Um, all this really did was create a hash entry with a key consisting of the service name and version and the file um, as a stringified uh, JSON. Keep in mind that uh, you can also use a shell script to drive the Redis CLI. So using hkdo, we can see the config version for all the, the asset service. We can also uh, pull a specific version using um, the hget command with the version of the config. So let's recap. We saw Redis uh, can be used to store application uh, configuration files. Uh, the Redis hash data structure makes that possible. Each config is um, indexed using the, the uh, service version um, label, and the contents uh, just contains JSON text. Wow, we've covered a lot, but in summary, um, what I've shared here is an approach that, is, uh, that very heavily leverages Redis using JavaScript and Node.js. However, there's nothing preventing anyone from doing the same with other languages, and because Hydra is open sourced, it can serve as a reference platform for such efforts. I'm pleased to announce we have a Hydra-inspired Go version in development, which we hope to open source soon. Now, that's how uh, Hydra leverages Redis and how we were able to both build and launch our Fly Anywhere platform. I'd like to show you how it all turned out. Here's a photo of our Bluetooth-enabled bike and metrics display. So a key call out here is that our microservices are dealing with real-time communication. Our bikes emit real-time data which devices package uh, into messages and transport via WebSockets. And Hydra Router routes them to their target microservices. We broadcast live from our production studio in New York City. The studio utilizes state-of-the-art broadcasting equipment, similar to what you'd find in a news station. However, perhaps unlike other studios, ours runs a collection of microservices which support the automation of each live broadcast. So microservices power our production studios and serve customers via our AWS infrastructure. And we do all of this using lightweight microservices powered by Redis. We think this is all pretty badass. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. If you're interested in applying these ideas or have questions, please feel free to reach out. Thanks for watching. Thanks for that, Carlos. So we have uh, plenty of time for questions here. So uh, who's up first? I would be interested to know, uh, how did you handle the transaction management when you interact with different microservices? So, so um, in our particular case, our microservices are focused largely on 
moving data from you know, the bikes in real time um, in, you know, into, our, into the, our infrastructure. Um, there isn't really transactional aspects per se um, in this case, right? Because you have a class that's running, you have a, a, a bunch of participants in the class, and so this is all pretty segregated um, in that sense, right? So it's not something that's come up, but we, our shop uses a combination of like RDS and, and, and MongoDB, so, you know, transaction capabilities there um, along the way, but that's... Uh, uh, my question about transactions is basically uh, interacting with microservices, two of them succeeds and a couple of them fails. You need to uh, roll back. I, I see like you answered that it's mostly a messaging or sending information. Uh, but my lines are about uh, like how about the two requests succeeds for and then two fails and I have to go back and then take back the data or roll back. So there's a, there's essentially, there's retry at the service level, at, at that level, there's retries, and it'll just go to another uh, microservice if the, the microservice wasn't able to uh, respond to and process the request. So. Hi. Um, I have a question about the microservices. Can you speak a little louder? Sorry. Hello. Yeah, I have a question about the microservices itself. You explained the diagram about the monolithic operation the normal vertical scaling kind of an application. Uh, so in that kind of an application, we had the advantage of the speed, right? So yes. uh, you do 10 operations sequentially, but it is done in a particular time. But when you expand it to a microservice, authentication happens first in a microservice component, then the next operation happens. So the trip taken to complete the <coughs> complete operation takes a longer time to complete. So do you think it's an advantage to go towards microservices? So, so um, not all operations are, are sequential. I mean, I understand that, sure, you need to have a user authenticated before other, they perform other actions on the system. So yes to that. Um, but, uh, but you do have the ability to process these um, you know, requests um, you know, at scale. And so, um, you, you know, these are, these are a case of trade-offs, right? If you want absolute speed, my recommendation is, you know, you write assembly or you write C++ as I did for most of my career. Uh, worked on game development, right? You know, you can focus on speed if that's your goal. Um, if your goal is sort of a flexibility, uptime, scalability, um, then, you know, then you have to allow for um, things to possibly taking longer. But you can optimize for them. Keep in mind that, um, you know, you can look at your, at your infrastructure and determine where the operations can, can be sped up with what kind of hardware. A, a good example is that um, you, know, you can divide um, the request coming in from the outside from your infrastructure. Obviously, as microservices communicate with one another, that's at, that's at a much faster speed than going over public um, internet. And so you, know, you really have to look at each of these key pieces. And um, you, you, know, you have a keen observation, which is, Hey, when we had a monolith, right? At least things were like, you know, super fast, you know. Um, but then you realize with your monolith that, well, you know, you need to, um, you know, add a new algorithm or you need to change something, and now you need to scale the whole darn thing together as one piece and allocate resources for that one piece, as opposed to being having the the benefit of granularity. So, uh, software development, right? It's all about trade-offs. <laughs> Any more questions? I think that's it. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.